Just a warning, this episode contains strong language because history does sometimes. Labor Day, September 7th, 1907. After a major rally, people began to make their way through the streets of Vancouver. As the crowds grew, they sang the song that had become a national anthem, Maple Leaf Forever. In days of yore, from Britain's shore, Wolf, the dauntless hero, came and planted firm Britannia's flag on Canada's fair domain. When the group, now in the hundreds, turned down Powell Street, they grew louder and began to pick up rocks. By the following morning, shards of glass from smashed windows were everywhere. Both Japantown and Chinatown had been vandalized. The anti-Asian riots of Vancouver would result in then-Deputy Labor Minister Mackenzie King helping to facilitate controls on Japanese immigration into Canada. Forty years later, those restrictions would set the stage for the now Prime Minister Mackenzie King to address the House of Commons on what he would call Canada's Japanese problem. This is The Secret Life of Canada, a podcast about the country you know and the stories you don't. Hey, Leah. Hey, Phelan. So I've been doing some reading. Reading. What is this reading you speak of? I've just been watching trash TV. (laughs) I'm assuming you've been watching trash TV. Okay, yeah, I've been balancing my trash TV with really important history. So by day, I've been reading about the Tashmi internment camp, the largest camp that forcibly housed Japanese Canadians during World War II. And by night, I watch Too Hot to Handle. It reminds me that humanity can persevere (laughs) through some of the worst imaginable circumstances. And also that humanity is the worst for green lighting, vacuous TV shows, which I watch and uh, I love. This could be a whole separate podcast, honestly. Like, we could do Too Hot to Handle. (laughs) I am already, like, ready for season two. But today we're here to talk about Tashme. Yeah, today we're going to look at a significant part of the Japanese-Canadian story. So first I want to tell you about when Japanese-Canadians started coming to Canada, and then why 90% of the Japanese-Canadian population was forced into internment camps during World War II, and then a bit of what happened after. Also, I learned that the province of BC at this time, and actually for a long time, was not great. And that this story about Japanese Canadians, although it's history, feels really relevant to what is happening right now in the world. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And and yes, I want to know all of these things. Okay. Well, I have all the answers. Great. I mean, well, I have most of... You know what? I just... I chatted with several Japanese Canadians who had the answers. That's a good move. Hi, I'm Lisa Iweta. I'm the collections manager with the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center. And I look after the museum's uh, museum collection and archives. So the Nikkei place is a museum, but it's also a community center and an assisted living facility for Japanese Canadian elders. It's in Burnaby, BC. That sounds amazing. Okay. I don't think I have ever heard of a museum that also houses a living space for elders. It makes so much sense, though, right? Because elders are like living libraries and they carry so much knowledge. Yeah, and the more I learned about Japanese culture and about the experiences of Japanese Canadians during the war, it makes perfect sense. It's so important to take care of the generations who came before us and especially Um, Within our community, there was a lot of advocacy to build housing for seniors within our community, knowing that immediately after the war, so many of them were retirement age and couldn't start all over. Because our mandate at the Nika National Museum is to honor, preserve and share Japanese culture and Japanese Canadian history for a better Canada, we feel it's our responsibility to offer not only a public space, but also a home for our seniors. So what happened to Japanese Canadians during the war was a turning point in their community and for Canada as a country. But let's look at what life was like for them before the war. 
Right. And to be clear, we're talking about the Second World War, which started in the late 30s and lasted until the mid 40s, with Germany invading Poland. A few years later, the war escalated when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Right. But, you know, from what I learned, what life was like for the Japanese community before this happens, it seemed like there was always a simmering resentment from the Canadian ruling class towards their community, especially from the B.C. government. Warning, folks, if you were part of the B.C. government during the 1870s to about 1950s, you're not going to come out of this looking good. That's very kind of you to give that warning. (laughs) Well, just in case, you know. Yeah. So do we know who the first Japanese person was to arrive in Canada? Yeah, it was in the late 1800s. And that first generation of Japanese people who arrived in Canada are known as the Issei. In Japanese, Issei means a first generation Japanese immigrant who moved and settled in another country. The Nisei are their children, the second generation born outside Japan. And then the third generation are known as the Sansei. The fourth are the Yonsei. So, for instance, David Suzuki, who is a Japanese-Canadian environmentalist, he would be known as a Sansei. He was that generation. But Manzo Nagano, who was the first to land in Canada as a Japanese person, is an Issei. That sounds so much more poetic or nice than, I don't know, the the names that we have for generations like, I don't know, uh, like... uh, Millennials or uh, Zillennials or, yeah, Generation X or, you know, a boomer. Like, do you think people say, uh, okay, Sansei? <laughs> uh, no, I get the feeling that there's a lot of respect in <laughs> their community. So. But I do, I do think <laughs> Yonsei, Yonsei does have like a, it sounds like another short form for Beyonce. Uh, I mean, that is a Yonsei. lucky generation. And I do have to say, and I, I didn't know this myself, our producer TK told me that Yonsei, like, is the fourth generation, right? Beyonce's favorite number is four. And I don't know what that means (laughs) other than that generation is a lucky generation, that they have that connection. (laughs) (laughs) That is a very random fact to know, and I am glad to know it. (laughs) It always comes back to Beyonce. Right. Getting back to Manzo Nagano, he was the very first recorded Issei. A young sailor, he was about 22, and he arrived in B.C. in 1877. Like most of the stories we've looked at, unfortunately, it's not going to be a huge surprise that the first wave of Japanese immigrants were met with, you know, like... Oh, okay. Okay, I know. Uh, It was probably like a a welcome basket of of baked goods, like Nanaimo bars and like butter tarts and like maybe some, I don't know, CDs. Nanaimo bars. CDs. I said it was 1877, (laughs) not 1997. No, their welcome basket contained only like suspicion and discrimination, basically. The Issei settled in Vancouver, Victoria, and in the surrounding areas of BC, like the Fraser Valley, settling there would lead to almost the entire population of Japanese Canadians living in British Columbia for some time. Now, the province of BC was, how should I put this terrible? It was terrible at this time. You seem to have that readily available, (laughs) so I think you do. (laughs) They, you know, took First Nations land, as we know, all the while refusing to sign treaties. That is why the majority of B.C. still to this day is on unceded territory. Yes, 95% of British Columbia has been built on unceded territory. That means the government of Canada has no claim or right to the land. Yeah, and when BC joined Confederation, they celebrated with a law prohibiting Indigenous and Chinese people from voting. Just yeah, I, I think it's interesting to note that at this time in BC, there are around 35,000 Indigenous people and 5,000 Chinese people. The European population was the minority at around only 10,000. So one way to win an election, I guess, is to make sure that the majority of the people who maybe wouldn't vote for you can't vote at all. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, voter suppression is real, man, and we did it in Canada. But, you know, B.C. didn't want to look like they were singling out Indigenous and Chinese people. So in 1895, they added Japanese people and then eventually South Asian people to the you can't vote because we're scared of you list. (laughs) All of this encouraged an undercurrent of anti-Asian sentiment that led to the 1905's hit hate group, the Asiatic Exclusion League. I'm not making this up. That is actually what they were called. So we've talked about this group before and and I will repeat, you know, it does it does it does sound like a Wes Anderson movie. 
It really, really does. does. <laughs> yeah, like... the first time I heard about it, I just assumed it was like a movie with Lucy Liu where she leads a powerful group of Asian women who are secret assassins and they are led by George Takei who gives them, you know, assignments or something. Right. Okay, like, so isn't like this basically thing. the plot of Charlie's Angels except it's like an all-Asian yes, cast? And and you know what? They should have done an all-Asian reboot to Charlie's Angels instead of the new Kirsten Stewart one. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's not I good. haven't. Okay, you saw it? It's bad. Because I thought it was supposed to be good. I don't know. No, I don't know bad. why I think that. <laughs> it was very bad, much like the actual Asiatic Exclusion League. Nice. Also bad. Nice segue. Nice tie-in. <laughs> good, good work. Okay. Okay, so this Canadian hate group was based on an American version, right, uh, which went by the name of the Japanese and Korean Exclusion League. European settlers didn't recognize they were on indigenous land. And because of that, they saw others, such as Japanese, Japanese people who were also arriving, like they did, as foreigners, as people who were taking their jobs and moving into their neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. And all the indigenous people were like, um, hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah. They were like, hey, guys, let's have a conversation <laughs> like, here. Hey, you guys are the shittiest neighbors. <laughs> you've missed some of the points. Yeah. Anyway. Um in September of 1907, anti-Asian riots broke out in Vancouver, with people carrying signs reading, Keep Canada White. Both Chinatown and Little Tokyo, or Japantown, were targeted. So for two days, the Japanese community went out and fought off the rioters in the streets. They had bricks, rocks, whatever weapons they could find. By the end of it, most of the businesses had been robbed or vandalized, and a Japanese language school was burnt to the ground. Oh, God. And right. So this is what you were describing um, at the beginning of the show. And we've got pics up on Instagram and Twitter if you want to check them out. The damage was devastating. OK, so what happened after that? So a couple of people were charged and the government in Canada did apologize mostly to the government of Japan and not the actual Japanese Canadians that and Chinese Canadians that were affected. Oh, my God. <laughs> I guess it was more of a like, you know, wanting to look. Good. I don't know. The government started commissions for Chinese and Japanese people to get compensation. And some people did get money for their businesses. But, you know, I, it's just I, I knew I knew there was a butt coming here. Yeah. But the yeah. <laughs> general sentiment was to blame, you know, the hot weather for the riots and also what? the Japanese. <laughs> yeah. You know. I mean, I blame the weather for plenty of things. <laughs> but a riot? Come on. But also, you know, they also blame the Chinese and Japanese people for immigrating in the first place. Like, guys, you should have expected us to break your businesses. I mean, you moved here. That's essentially kind of oh the tone God. that was coming out. So instead of cracking down on the Asiatic Exclusion League, the provincial government of BC pressured the federal government of Canada, and that saw Deputy Labor Minister Mackenzie King, whose face now graces our $50 bill because he became prime minister, by the way, he helped to restrict Japanese immigration to 400 laborers per year. So the result was crackdown on immigration, essentially. Yeah. And so this was the atmosphere Japanese Canadians were living under prior to World War II. Yeah. And I mean, you know, people went on with life, obviously, but there was always a feeling that Canada did not want them there. Despite that, the Japanese community really made a place for themselves in fishing, especially farming. They built Japanese language schools, stores, you know, racism. Yeah, it was there. But life in B.C. was good. And they were citizens just trying to make a life for themselves like everybody else. It was, right. you know. It was fine. Like all the other immigrants here. <laughs> like everybody else. Yes. But by the time the war began, it just didn't take much for the government to decide that Japanese Canadians, people who were born and had lived in Canada for several generations by this point, were not Canadian. They were the enemy. Fear and war hysteria resulted in the forced removal and dispossession of Canadians. Um Systemic racism has always existed in BC, so the tension was even higher by the time Canada declared war on Japan following the December 7th, 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor. The federal government invoked the War Measures Act and labeled Japanese Canadians as enemy aliens, despite the army, RCMP, and the government declaring that Japanese Canadians were no danger or threat to national security. 
So in January of 1942, BC Premier John Hart appointed um, the cabinet minister George Pearson to lead a delegation to Ottawa to partner with Vancouver MP Ian McKenzie to advocate for the forced removal of all Japanese Canadians from the province. And so a month later, the federal government passed the executive orders necessary to start that process and later the dispossession of property. And even even municipalities joined in and supported it. Vancouver's mayor at the time, Jack Cornette, was quoted as saying, deport all Japs, you know, get them out of here. Things were bad, obviously, and they were so bad and tense that Chinese folks started to wear buttons with the words, I'm Chinese, so they wouldn't face the abuse that was being inflicted on Japanese Canadians. Oh, God. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, yeah so... When people were forced out of their homes, was it, you know, was it gradual over a couple of years or months or like, was it really fast? I mean, Lisa told me it was a bit of both. There's always been that systemic racism. So knowing that and knowing that policies have always been in place to marginalize peoples, then you could say it's gradual. But when the War Measures Act was enacted, everything happened really quickly that resulted in um, the injustices done to Japanese Canadians. The War Measures Act was enacted on December 7th, right as soon as the news of Pearl Harbor broke um, and Canada declared war on on Japan. And the next day, 1,200 fishing vessels were rounded up and detained in Annieville Slough, which is near New Westminster. And you had to be a Canadian citizen or naturalized Canadian to own a fishing vessel and a license, but the Canadian Navy, under the um, orders of the government, still rounded up all the vessels anyways. And some of the men were out on the water when it happened and had their Navy, uh, the Navy crews come up to them and escort them all the way down to Annieville Slough. And those who were from the north, like Prince Rupert, and they were out on the water, they didn't have a chance to go home, tell their families, get their belongings, um, you know, put on a, a warmer coat. They often never returned home ever again. Many men just disappeared all of a sudden. They were removed from a hundred mile zone that the Canadian government decided was a protection zone. For them, the Canadian government, it was too close to the water and they said they didn't want Japanese people too close to a port. They were, I guess, worried about a homeland attack, especially by fishermen. There were a lot of Japanese fishermen because they saw their boats as a threat. You know, I guess they thought they would put bombs on the boat. So anyway, they took many of these men and sent them to road camps. The big fear was that Canada had one of the largest populations of fluent Japanese speakers in the British Empire. And so instead of seeing this as a benefit, the government used it to justify internment. And the men were forced out to road camp projects, uh, forced labor projects, um, building Canada's highways, uh, mostly in BC. And some were sent out to other labor places in Ontario, such as mushroom farming. And those who resisted and protested and didn't want to be separated from their families, they ended up getting wrongfully detained and incarcerated in prisoner of war camps until after the end of the war. The road camps, which included the Yellowhead Blue River Highway Project that runs um, uh, north of BC, all the way up near Jasper and into Alberta, that project there, they had such grueling conditions. The first men who were rounded up Uh, were sent there and they lived in the train cars because there was no adequate housing for them. There was no food for them. Um, If there was, it wasn't meeting nutritional value. So they did their best to speak up. They had a community representative speak to the person in charge um, to try and get better conditions for them. They were paid surprisingly very low compared to the other forced labor um, individuals who were working there, uh, many who were dukabors, but they were of a, a white background, so they were paid a little bit more. When I'm on major highways in Canada, I always think about the Indigenous people who probably laid the foundation. Well, you know what? It's interesting that you bring that up because Yellowhead, I learned when I was in BC this year, Yellowhead was the name of an Indigenous or the name given to an Indigenous guide, basically. His name was Yellowhead, and he it was his trail. 
that's yeah, that's why highlight. there's like the Yellowhead Institute, and yeah. So it's like, and I mean, we've come up against this before, right? Where it's like indigenous sort of like foundation, and then uh, forced labor by yeah. people who are deemed in the name of development. Not, yes, like named like less worthy or less important than white settlers, and so it's like, yeah. Anyway, this all makes me think about and look at highways in BC very differently. And so Japanese men were also working with other communities that were forced to work, right? Yeah, I mean, there were about 24,000 people interned during the Second World War. Some religious groups like Russian Dukabors and Mennonites, they opposed military service, and because of that, they were interned. Some German Canadians were interned uh, because, you know, same as Japanese Canadians, they saw Germany, who they were fighting as the threat. And some of the camps actually also held captured enemy German soldiers. So if people were caught in the war over overseas as POWs, they would actually bring them back to Canada and put them in POW camps here. It was part of the Allied effort. Like everybody had to have POW camps on their soil. It didn't matter how far away or how close you were to Europe. Okay, so when Italy entered the war, 600 Canadian Italian men were actually placed into camps in Canada, into POW camps, and 2,300 Jewish refugees were brought to Canada, and they had to live in POW camps alongside Nazi soldiers. It's just... I know. That's so messed up. I can't process that. Close to 90% of the Japanese Canadian population, around 22,000 people, would be forcibly relocated in the largest mass exodus in Canadian history. So much internment. So much. And it affected so many people for years. Here is a clip of David Suzuki remembering how his experiences of internment from the age of five to nine affected the rest of his life. Well, for a long time, of course, um, Especially when I became a teenager, I was very, very confused, bitter. I didn't want to have anything to do with Japanese kids because they were a constant reminder of the fact that I was one of them. And yet I was terrified to have any social activity with white kids because of my experiences from the camp. So it was a period of self-hate and um, spending a lot of time fantasizing about how I could escape and assume a white skin and be accepted by everybody else. I didn't know David Suzuki was interned. And he's like, he's considered a Canadian treasure. Yeah. Certain generations of a certain age, if they are Japanese Canadian, they were there. Or a relative was there. But basically they were there because the population was not big and 90% of them went and were interned. Of course. It makes so much sense. I, I feel like, of course... Of course, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so some of the Japanese men are sent off to build highways and roads in B.C. and and Alberta. So I'm kind of afraid, but what happens next? I was going to try and, like, make it sound positive, but here we go. So by February, people start anticipating things to come. I read accounts of people buying all of the warm clothes they could and just, you know, stores running out of all sorts of supplies. Japanese businesses held closing out sales because they knew that they were probably going to get forced to leave. A couple weeks after that, the federal government ordered all persons of the quote-unquote Japanese race to leave the coast. They had to leave B.C. By March, all of the men, women, and children, and elderly, were sent to internment camps. The British Columbia Security Commission was established just for this to plan, supervise, and direct this forced removal. Okay, so they send the men away in the first mm-hmm. wave, mm-hmm. and then everybody goes. Mm-hmm. Some right. men, like not all the men. It was like a portion of men and then basically everybody else. Right. Yeah. Okay. What are like what are some of the accounts of this time? I mean, really, it wasn't that long ago. I can't Mm-mm. I just can't imagine what that would be like. You know, what did people bring with them? How did they cope? Well, to get a better sense of that, I reached out to two Japanese Canadian artists who created the Tashmi project. The project traces the experiences of the Nisei before and after internment. 
Hi, my name is Julie Tomiko Manning, and I am one of the creators and performers of the Tashmi Project, The Living Archives. And I'm Matt Miwa, and I am uh, the other creator of the Tashmi Project, The Living Archives. Um, we both were actors in the National Art Center acting company. So we worked there for a couple of months. And so throughout those months, Matt and I got to know each other and we discovered that we were both half Japanese. And then we discovered that both of our families had gone to the same internment camp, which was a really crazy thing. And so the two of us wanted to delve into that history that had been really difficult for us to uh, find as we were growing up because no one wanted to talk about it. But we figured together we were stronger to kind of attack uh, the idea of a, a bit of a missing history. And I think that we also were very concerned that the generation, the Nisei, the second generation, who were children during the internment, were all reaching an age I mean, to be honest, we were afraid of losing them uh, soon um, because they're all in their 80s um, and 90s. We wanted to get their stories and at the same time create a story for the community itself. Julie and Matt told me many stories of internment have not been passed down. It's been this unspoken thing in a lot of Japanese-Canadian families. So they felt this urgency because growing up, they had only heard one or two details about that time. I remember stories that were told in the family, and I'm not even sure who told them. But there was one story about uh, waking up to icicles beside them in the bed because the walls were not insulated and because it was so cold in the winter. And then the other story was waking up in Hastings Park, which is where they gathered uh, everyone before sending them to the internment camps. And so everyone was on bunk beds and the kids would go on top. And so my aunt would talk about waking up in the morning and seeing everybody's heads pop up. But the stories were fun stories. Like they were, there were just these two memories and they were like, Oh my God, when I was a kid, that guy woke up next to icicles, you know? <laughs> I remember my grandmother describing, uh, I asked why they went to internment. I don't even know how I knew, but she just said, oh, uh, yes, they were, they were afraid we were all carrying these big knives. And then she did a flourish with her hand and like a, a scary face. Uh, and then she laughed. <laughs> For me, this makes sense. It would it makes sense that the good stories are what's shared. That's like a really common thing for residential school survivors. You know, sometimes you have to paint your trauma with the brush that you need to survive. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And you know, they knew that and they felt that, and they really wanted to just try and see if they could get people to talk about what happened there or their experiences. So in the end, they interviewed over 60 people who were at Tashmi so they could learn more. And frankly, we could all learn more. Like, what are the odds that both their families were interned in the same camp? Like, that's, yeah, that's just like mind blowing. I mean, actually... The odds were pretty good because Tashmi was the biggest camp. It was built on a ranch in B.C. about 14 miles southeast of the town of Hope. Hope beside an internment camp. That's, yeah, yeah that's, um, that's really intense. I know, I know. Um, the irony. Yeah, so the camp had a population of some 2,600 people. Like Julie and Matt discovered, many of the people they interviewed were children when they were sent to Tashmi. Here is Julie reading the account of Molly, who describes what happened when her mother was told they had to leave their homes. Yeah, suitcase each. It was sad because Mama, all our mothers, had to do this gathering up of what we're going to take. And then it was sort of like a garage sale. We would put things we can't take outside, and then the people would come by and they would put 25 cents or whatever. And my sister Toyo said, no, I can't do it. But I would stand there and I said, no, you can't. You have to pay a little bit more. <laughs> you know, I was young then, but I wasn't going to let them have everything free. That was hard. 
dishes and just, you know, big display things. And here they would just not even offer a dollar. We did have one friend, a friend of a friend, and said, we will keep your things. So we trusted. We shipped, you know, packed it and put it over there at their house. But that was all gone. I mean, they didn't keep for us. It was gone. Yeah. So it's just a case of you lost it. Ne. It would be beautiful Japanese old vases that you see in these collector things. Beautiful things and dishes that were beautiful. But you could not take them with you. It was more clothing you took. Kimono, those kind of things, you know, you didn't know where to give it. You just put it outside because you couldn't pack it, no. Those were luxury, ne. You didn't do kimono or anything you had for odori. No, no, those were luxury. They were not necessity, and this was necessity time. It was sad because the mothers at that time, they were young mothers, eh? Here they had to gather up things we could take, no pots, no pans, no kitchen knives, nothing like that. So we had to start all over again, didn't we? Hardship all around, you know. But it's wonderful in the way that everybody looked after each other. Because in our way, families with little children, you would look after the little children for mummy, you know, for the mum. I always think that the mothers had it so hard. One lady had a mental breakdown on the train because her husband was taken away, her son was taken away, and she was all alone. And she had a mental breakdown. She accused everybody, and there was no one there to help her. And we had to live with this for, I think, two to three days on the train, yelling. We didn't know what to do. The mothers all had little ones to look after, and here she is walking around, ranting away. But she was so... She just lost it because her husband was taken away, her son was taken away, and she's all alone. That was hard. Yeah. So... That was a lesson for me, to see something could go wrong, mentally. Okay, so how did the government decide who's going where? I mean, Tashme was near Hope, B.C., but there were camps all over the place. Well, here's Matt reading what Harold remembers. Right away when the war broke out, okay? Right away we became enemy, like in Canada. We're enemy aliens, okay? (laughs) Now to keep track of where all the Japanese people were, all the people living outside Vancouver, Eucalypt, Cumberland, Victoria, they're all over the place, so they couldn't keep track of where they were. So it was easier for them to round them all up, bring them to Vancouver. (laughs) But they had to put them someplace, so they put them Hastings Park. You with me so far? Hastings Park was like a CNE exhibition, right? They still have it every summer. They call theirs p Pacific National Exhibition. They have it every August, just like Toronto, like CNE. Uh, they used to call it Happy Land. You know, they have all the rides and all the games and everything. <laughs> so when we first got to uh, Hastings Park, they forgot to put a fence up. So we were all out there on all the games and rides and everything else, but uh, only lasted for a couple of days. And they put the brass fence, barbed wire fence up. We couldn't use it anymore. Hastings Park now has a uh, whole new feeling attached to it. That's like one hell of an image. All these kids on rides in an internment camp. That is just like, sounds like a horror movie. Yeah. And Lisa told me about how most people obviously, like us, look at this park as this beautiful place, but just don't know its history. Uh, Often folks have a very positive memory of going to the fairs and enjoying the rides and the carnival. Um, But for our community, it's often a haunted memory of knowing that women and children were housed in the livestock barn uh, where they lined up bunk beds with straw mattresses and placed them in the horse stalls. And there were feces everywhere, maggots everywhere. People recount horrible stories of the smell and the stench, and it just permeated in everything that you wore and owned. Hastings Park had set up, because there were so many people, um, they set up the men who were 18 and over in a separate facility. So they were housed away from their families in the foreign building. And if young boys wanted to go and visit their mothers, they had to go and get a permit 
to be able to enter into the livestock uh, building. So because of everybody that was in there, they also had to come up with a mess hall and feed everyone. But the food often caused severe cases of diarrhea because it was terrible. And the toilets were literally livestock troughs that were flipped up to have water running and makeshift seats were placed on top. There was no privacy. It was horrendous conditions. They also had very limited bathing and laundry facilities. It was just horrendous. And those who were ill uh, spent a lot longer. There was a makeshift hospital in the livestock barn and they used discarded furniture to make about 100 or so, 180 or so general beds. Um, And they even had a TB tuberculosis wing in the poultry section of the livestock barn. Um, Children who got sick were placed underground in a cellar. Many people ended up dying because of the unsanitary conditions. And those who were ill, because it took longer to build other makeshift hospitals in the internment camps, they ended up staying into um, the early part of 1943. So they could have been there for longer than six months easily. Okay, so what does Tashme mean in Japanese? Because I realize I've been saying it and I don't know what it means. Oh, yeah. I had this exact question for Julie and Matt. I always thought that Tashmi was a Japanese name because it actually sounds quite Japanese. But it's the first three letters of the last names of three men that worked for the B.C. Security Commission. So T.A. is from Taylor and then S.H. is from Shiris and M.E. is from Mead. Okay, well, that's a surprise. (laughs) I know, Um, right? Okay, so who were these men? So they were two cops. Uh, One was a B.C. uh, police and one was an RCMP uh, dude and a businessman. Two cops and a businessman. That sounds like um, like a movie, you know, for um, maybe an adult would enjoy (laughs) on an an evening for special alone time. It's what a lot of people are doing in quarantine right now. It sounds like a store and like, you know. It, it does like, sound like in two Greenwich in a village <laughs> that sells leather. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a bit leather, Daddy. <laughs> yeah, two cops and a businessman. Two cop. I don't Open. know. Two cops and a businessman. All I can see is mustaches. I just, it's just like mustaches galore. <laughs> It is very mustachy. It, it's a very and it's only, mustachy. Like, it's only open from like 7 p.m. to 3 in the morning. Like this is yeah. not a day. Anyway, exactly. two cops and a businessman. Moving it's like on, two cops moving and on. A, two, two cops and a businessman. <laughs> it just sounds so closeted. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, could go, I could go in any directions with this, but let's get back to the matter at hand here. Uh-huh. Okay. Tashmi. Tashmi, it was uh, the biggest camp, so... Mm-hmm. What was it like? Okay, well, Lisa told me that at the time... There wasn't a major highway running through, so it was very isolated. As a result, it became a small town on its own. It had its own school, hospital, power plant, butcher shop, RCMP detachment, fire hall, churches, a commercial center. They even made their own shoyu, which is soy sauce and miso. Yeah, they made their own soy sauce and miso. Isn't that amazing? Of course they did. Yeah, they were like, okay, this sucks, but we're going to try and work with it. It's Yeah, it's I mean, like, th- them making their own soy sauce and miso, them, you know, just making, you know, figuring out how to live their lives the best way they could at the time is, I think, such a testament to to them and their survival. Yeah. And it sounds like a real town. Yeah. Like, you don't really think of internment camps as having schools and hospitals. No, I completely felt the same way when I was reading this. I think the adults there, I just get a sense that they were really trying to make it as livable as possible for the children and the elderly. But make no mistake, it was not great. Yeah. You know, Tashmi consisted of 347 just shacks, which people had to sleep in. And it would often be two families. So it slept up to eight people. So you would be put in, you know, with a family you didn't know. And I mean, people who don't know each other and there are no interior doors and some just use curtains for privacy. Yeah, it was terrible. Do you know what the buildings are like in Tashmi? On the inside? It was a central door. Central, and then there would be 
two bedrooms on each side. And it's all just tar paper, you know. It's just shacks, so it was very, very cold. And you would have the pot-bellied stove all... And then it was a dry sink. It was filled with water. And when we woke up in the morning, it was ice. I remember that in the winter time. And would have a sink outside with... Initially, they didn't have taps, so that every two houses sort of had a tap in the middle outside. So you'd have to take buckets and bring it inside. That's why if you spilled any on your floor, ice rink, <laughs> it was that cold, that cold. I remember that. It's so interesting to hear how these Nisei elders remember it as children. Like, you know, you remember the physical things like the the icicles, but maybe you don't remember how stressed or upset all the adults were. Or maybe you do when you try to forget it. Yeah, the experiences were so different based on how old you were. Here's Lisa again. For those who were older children and in high school or even graduating and starting to go to university, their lives were completely disrupted. Everything came to a standstill. There were no job opportunities. There was no graduation. They eventually were able to finish their schooling by correspondence, and they had to pay for their books. They had to pay for someone to um, to grade their tests, um, and all of that was handled through the BC Security Commission. The parents really, and the community at large, really did all that they could to protect the children uh, from these hardships. And nobody really knew how long this would go on for. Many believed it would only be a couple months, maybe a year. So they did everything they could. You know, despite all of that, it seems people were still expecting that when the war ended, they would get back their homes and possessions because that's what they were told by the Canadian government. But in January of 1943, the government gave in to pressure from B.C. politicians and sold off all of the properties seized from Japanese Canadians. In 1943, the government decided to forcibly sell everyone's property that was under the custodian of enemy properties care, which was supposed to be a, a trusted authority to keep everyone's stuff safe. They sold everyone's property, whether it be dishes, uh, land, cars, etc., to pay for their own internment. So people didn't have anything to come back to. It was gone. Maybe a few people here and there were able to make arrangements with friends or neighbors to look after the property, to buy it from them, transfer the leases. But for the most part, Everything was lost. So when the government came in at the end of the war, they really didn't want individuals returning back to the coast. Um, they wanted to keep them as far away and keep it that, you know, white dominant Vancouver, B.C. society as much as possible. Um, and so the government declared that, yes, you have to pick to go further east, which many people did. Um, or you had to sign up and we would pay for your deportation from Canada and wrongful exile and we'll send you to Japan. Is she saying they told everyone they either had to move to somewhere else in Canada, as in not in B.C., or go to Japan, a country where the majority had never been and many didn't speak the language? Yep. It was the timeless gem of go back to where you came from even though you aren't from there. It was a really difficult decision. Many families were fraught about the idea of having to choose. The Issei generation, which is first generation, they may have have had property in Japan or knew that their brother would look after them or their you know sister. And so knowing that they had lost everything and that they were over 60, they really saw no other way of survival. But if they had Canadian children who were over the age of 16, they could choose on their own whether or not they wanted to go or stay. So oftentimes it resulted in families being separated. In 1946, the government started to wrongfully exile Japanese Canadians, and about 4,000 people ended up being deported to uh, Japan, most of which were Canadian citizens, and most of which from that had never even been to Japan before, let alone showing up in a war-torn country, not speaking the language, being rejected by their families. 
And just think of what it was like for the Nisei and the Sansei having to go to Japan, many of them for the first time. It's just been bombed to oblivion after having two atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. People there were starving. Many of the relatives they may have had were no longer there. I mean, a lot of people who were sent to Japan were ostracized because they were Canadian. I mean, they were culturally Canadian. They were not considered Japanese from the Japanese people living in Japan. And so it was another struggle. It was really hard. Many did stay and were able to build a life there, but many just wanted to go home. After the war ended, Japanese Canadians pieced together a new and very different life. In 1947, the National Association of Japanese Canadians was formed, and a long journey to get recognition over the injustices during the war began. Forty years later, in 1988, the NAJC was able to negotiate a redress settlement with the federal government. And on September 22, 1988, then-Prime Minister Brian Mulroney formally apologized in the House of Commons to all Japanese Canadians. With the apology, the government also offered $21,000 to each interned person, a community fund was created, and they issued pardons for all who had been wrongfully imprisoned during this time. Canadian citizenship was also given back to Japanese Canadians and their descendants who had been deported to Japan. The NAJC also negotiated $24 million towards the creation of what is now the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, whose sole purpose is to work for the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination in Canada. That does not sound like enough of an apology. Just in my, in my, in my opinion, that's not enough of an apology. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it's good it was able to happen, though. And, you know, of course, 40 years later... That meant that many of the people who went through internment mm-hmm. never saw or felt that apology. Yeah. Here's here's the thing. Here's the thing that I'm like, Canada is like known for being like, you know, we always say sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just takes 40 years. Yeah. And sorry's good. But it would be better if we just don't have to keep apologizing for things anymore. I just, you know, it makes me think of all of the ripple effects, the things that we all lost as a result as Canadians. I mean, have you ever been to Japantown in Winnipeg? No. um, I haven't spent that much time in Winnipeg, but... Okay, what uh, about the Japantown in Montreal? I didn't know there was one in Montreal. Yeah, you didn't know because there isn't one. In fact, there are only two cities that have Japanese districts in Canada, and those are Vancouver and Toronto. And that's because many people in the community didn't want to be visible after the war for fear of, well, everything that had just happened. Yeah, the community was so forced to spread out as much as possible. And there was a lot of shame around being Japanese Canadian, speaking the language, doing cultural activities. So, so much was lost in that sense. And Japanese Canadians out of that fear and uh, with all the restrictions that were imposed for a long time, they never really crawled to create new Japan towns as they moved across the country. And if they uh, were starting to congregate too much in one neighborhood, new people looking to move in were told, oh no, keep, you know, keep going. There's too many of us here already. So it was really difficult, um, but the community was very supportive of one another and they knew that people were falling on hardships. Nobody would rent to them. Nobody would hire them. Uh, restaurants wouldn't feed them. They would refuse their service. So it was really the Jewish community, especially in Ontario, that really helped Japanese Canadians resettle and find their way and um, offer them a little bit of their dignity back. And so we see our community congregating very close to where the Jewish Canadians were congregating in the Toronto and GTA, uh, which is super interesting. But across the rest of the area, especially the prairies and um, in BC, we don't have, you know, a Japantown. That's so hard. Like when you're you're so afraid of the place you're in that you want to be invisible. I mean, so this is why places like Nikkei Place and, you know, Japanese cultural centers across the country, why they're so important now, right? Like, we need those spaces. Yeah, we need those spaces. I mean, I think they are the Japantowns in a way, you know, rebuilt but looking very differently. 
And so that's why now cultural centers kind of replace that feeling of not having a neighborhood to call our own anymore. And they've become an integral part of not only the healing process, but also reconnecting with language and culture and community and inviting those in who want to learn as well. I feel like I want to cheer, you know, every Japanese uh, business, it's like stores or schools, any any Japanese establishment I see. A hundred percent. I totally agree. But, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Police say they've seen an increase in hate motivated incidences targeting Asians. Vancouver police hope you can help them find suspects. The two separate and disturbing attacks. The call comes amid a rise in reports of attacks against Asian people in this city. Police report 11 anti-Asian based hate crimes last month alone and more incidents so far this year than all of 2019. When I heard about people of Asian descent being pushed to the ground and buildings being defaced with anti-Chinese slogans, I was angry. Hate has no place in British Columbia, period. We are in a time when anti-Asian rhetoric is on the rise around the world and in Canada, and we are seeing more hatred spewed against immigrants and refugees. I asked Lisa, Julie, and Matt, this new generation, what they took away from all of the stories they learned about the Issei, Nisei, and Sansei. You know, growing up in this idealistic, multicultural Canada terminology that's being thrown around, embracing diversity, it's hard to realize and to start to understand that Canada's policies don't always embrace diversity and the um, systemic racism built into law is quite shocking Um, and it doesn't just affect our community it targets anyone who they want to deem as a marginalized community Um, so it's taken a lot for my family to understand that to realize that the anger and the shame and uh, that feeling of losing their dignity wasn't their fault because they're Japanese Canadians it was the fault of the systemic racism built into the government policy so I'm constantly reminded every day because my family's experiences are intertwined with my work and um, this part of Canadian history is so integral to share. So myself, I try not to take for granted the privilege that I have as a Canadian. I just know that I love being Japanese Canadian and being amongst Japanese Canadians now more than ever. You know, I wasn't really connected to my community before this, um, this project. And now I'm on the board of the Ottawa Japanese Community Association, and I'm always hanging out with these people. I don't agree with any kind of nationalism. And I think that uh, the complexity of being Canadian is that we live in a country where, for example, um, people who have lost their jobs in this time of, in this pandemic time, can um, cannot fall through the cracks because the government is making sure that people continue to have some sort of financial stability. And there is a freedom that people have in Canada that other people don't have in other parts of the world. However, there is a huge danger in becoming nationalistic because it keeps us from seeing the issues that do still exist. Because something like this happened in Canada, it means that something like this can still happen in Canada. As we all know, um, there are so many issues with Indigenous communities that people are still turning a blind eye to. Is that the saying? And so I think that coming from a community who has lived through this legacy, we have a very complicated experience of being Canadian. It certainly helps in keeping my eyes open. It's so nice because we all remember (laughs) and don't remember um, the older generations in the same way. Older generations, uh, our ancestors, you know, they paved this way and they've given us everything that we have, uh, good or bad, 
and that's the common experience for all Canadians. And to form a deeper connection to your ancestors and to your elders uh, living in past is a super important way to keep society healthy and going and keep yourself healthy and uh, connected. There's a few points throughout the show where the generosity of the Nisei, the second ger generation, shines through where they don't blame their neighbors for what has happened to them. I think that we just have to keep uh, unsiloed and keep our connections to our neighbors very strong and remember that you're friends uh, with more people than you think, more people than you remember. Friendships will come out of you and they will surprise you. And I think that we have to let ourselves be open to that. The Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And it was also recorded at the Nikkei Museum in Burnaby, located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam Nations. It was written and hosted by me, Leah Simone Bowen. And me, Phelan Johnson. Our producer is TK Matunda. Our script editor is Yvette Nolan. Research assistance by Andrea Eidinger and CBC Archives. Our digital producer is Fabiola Melendez Carletti. The senior producer of CBC Podcasts is Tanya Springer. And executive producer is Arif Narani. For pictures on life in Tashmi, you can check us out at our website or on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at The Secret Life of Canada. If there's a story or piece of history you want to tell us about, email us at secretlifeofcanada at cbc.ca. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find us. Thanks for exploring Canada's hidden history with us. 